Thatcher or even Nelson Harris, former mayor and former president of this organization, has written a book about uh, Oaks Mill and Bent Mountain, suburb of Bono. The book will be out the next month or so, I mean, February 4th, Tuesday, fourth Tuesday night of uh, February, Nelson Harris will be here talking about his book. Well, we came to hear about Billy Mahone, with, uh, Rob Freese, you know, who has a day job at the newspaper, and otherwise he does a lot of work on the Civil War. He's writing a book about Billy Mahone. He had three careers, at least three young. Rob, come tell us about it. Hey. Let me say thanks to George uh, for the opportunity to come tonight, and also let's give honor to the Kegley family and their recent loss. And we have great sympathy and understanding of the magnitude of that and the contributions that they give to the community. So I didn't want that to go unrecognized so soon after the facts of Georgia, but very much in our thoughts and hearts. I'm Robert Freeze. I'm a local guy. Um, I grew up here in Roanoke. I'm still growing up in <laughs> uh, Virginia Heights, Woodrow Wilson, Patrick Henry, um, pretty close to home in many different ways. And it's nice to be here tonight with a group of people that relish um, history and have a deeper understanding of the magnitude of events and how to, the value of basically going back and, and sifting through it and, and comparing past and present. Because uh, our fellow tonight, uh, William Mahoney, is particularly felicitous as far as that's concerned as a topic. Um, he's really a fascinating guy, and not only fascinating because of the life he lived, but he's fascinating because he's so undervalued, or un relatively unknown, and his role in our lives today is not, hasn't been connected. Now, I will tell you, without too much fear of contradiction, that he's one of the reasons why we're sitting here tonight, literally, because he had a hand in the growth and the development of Roanoke, Virginia, which might have gone someplace else or been someplace else without his involvement, not directly but indirectly, but nonetheless, he still was a, a factor. And he's a, um, he's a pretty challenging guy to get a hold of because he had three separate extraordinary lives of significant achievement. Each one of these was profound enough in and of itself, but to put together, it makes for quite a 68-year run. Um, first, in no particular order, actually, um, he's a railroad man, and a very significant railroad man in the period of time in Virginia history when that was the leading industry and the driver of economic development and politics and all sorts of things with life in common. Secondly, he's a Civil War general. You probably know him best for that. Um, there's more written about one day of his life, July the 30th, 1864, the Battle of the Crater, than there is the whole rest of the 68 years, by far. The third thing, and the really compelling thing, I think, moving forward, to talk in, 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 in our history as a commonwealth and as a country is his contributions, or worst contributions, as political And those are the um, least known. And there are reasons for that that I will offer to you tonight for your consideration. Um, I'm happy to entertain comments or questions. This is a pretty informal group, so if you've got a question while I'm talking, it's not going to throw me off <coughs> to <coughs> so, I, it, you know, a dialogue would be fine, rather than sort of a passive sort of thing. As you can see, I'm not terribly scripted here, because I'll usually like to go extemporaneously rather than going by script, and that works out pretty well, but I'll let you be the judge of that as we move forward. So this man, um, Mahone, William Mahone, born in 1826 in Southampton County, Virginia. Everybody have a picture of where Southampton County is. Uh, I, I had um, visuals tonight, but uh, the, I, we couldn't get them synced up with the gizmos. We're all of the age where that 
would escape all of us automatically. So, in any event, Southampton County is in on the North Carolina border, down near present-day Suffolk. It's shaped like an anvil, so it's sticking up toward the James River. I don't. Do you think that will show up? My lovely wife here, Linda, is offering. She's going to be like a Carol Merrill. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. 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 <laughs> the, I miss my college. <laughs> Southampton County is a pretty profound place. It's it's wide open now, and there's not a whole lot going on down there. But um, it's the birthplace of Mahone. It's the birthplace of George Thomas, who was a significant Union officer. It's the birthplace of Pearl Bailey, I think. It's also the birthplace of Nat Turner. And it was also the location for the Nat Turner insurrection, which happened when Mahone was four or five, six years old. And that's more than just a coincidence because one of the really strong threads that runs throughout his life is the issue of race. And um, the story goes that his father put the family in a boat in the middle of either the Nottaway or the Blackwater River, one or the other, and put them out in the middle of the stream during the insurrection, or at least while the paranoia and the hysteria was going on, so they'd be protected from that. So that was very much a part of his early life. Um, originally, um, his father's name Fielding Mahone, and they're of Irish ancestry, not particularly high born, but still respectable people. He was a sort of entrepreneurial guy that tried a lot of ways to make a living. And um, the most profound event in Mahone's young life was when they moved from the countryside. His father bought a tavern, which is right on the Jerusalem Plank Road, present day, Route 58, in the middle of Cork, which is Cortland now. That's the county seat of South Carolina. It's right across from the courthouse, right across from the jail, at least at the present day courthouse. Not a big town. It's one of these rural Virginia communities where, you know, they call the place where the courthouse is the courthouse because it has a courthouse and some lawyer's offices and some of the constitutional offices around here, and that's pretty much good. In Southampton County in those days, um, prosperity had sort of moved through pretty rapidly from east to west because, as you know, when the first colonials came, they were all about planting as much tobacco as they could and making as much of a profit off of that for the Virginia company as they could. And they were also profoundly unaware of the impact that that had on the soil and its ability to produce any kind of crop because tobacco was very demanding of certain nutrients and they didn't know how to put it back in. So they tended to plant a few seasons, get what they could out of it, and then head west because why not the west was horizons. People that stayed were struggling, I think, a little more for prosperity in the wake of that. And Mahone's father is an example of that. He tried farming. He opened the tavern. The tavern was reasonably uh, effective as an income generator because there was traffic going back and forth east to west on that fairly main thoroughfare, which if you know um, the geography, which I'm sure you do, parallels the North Carolina border all the way across the state. So people came and went all the time. And I think that the other profound thing about that as far as his life was that he was exposed to a real diverse group of people and, and, and travelers and people on the road um, that you wouldn't encounter if you were located more in the back. And, and, and this was influential in his development. Uh, Mahone's a small person. He's about my height, about half my weight. Um, has a high-pitched voice. He's not a specimen. But he's a really smart guy, as we'll find out. And he's also has a, a certain amount of, 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 of genetic self-confidence. And that he's not afraid to confront people or take people on. I don't necessarily mean in a physical uh, sense, but he just, he'll engage with you. And he'll, 
he, he was always one to sort of see what you were made of, to try you out. And this seems to be characteristic from the time when he was a kid. There's this old story that developed during his political career that may or may not be true, that he bailed his father out a couple of times and earned his college tuition by playing poker. <laughs> and it's true throughout his life, he was an avid poker player. This is the sort of thing where you know he would try his wits against you, and that seemed to be characteristic of, of his personality throughout. Um, the family did have enough political connections and enough prosperity that he got into VMI um, at a time when VMI was a pretty young institution, uh, but uh, not as a full paid student. At that point there were a couple of what they call state scholarship students. He was one of them. So he went up there on scholarship in a very small class at that point in time. But surely that was known that he was there on the public dime. And that may have been another reason to put a chip on his shoulder. When he got there, and then it must have been quite a journey, if you can imagine somebody making that trip with wide eyes from flat Tidewater, Virginia, up through the rolling Piedmont, across the Blue Ridge, and into the Shenandoah Valley. That must have been like um, quite an epic journey. But when he got to Lexington, he did well. Um, he started out, he found that he wasn't as well prepped as some of his classmates, but he stuck with it. He was particularly good at the math and sciences thing, um, because he becomes an extraordinary engineer as a result. He also rises in his class, in terms of his class ranking, so he earns respect from his peers as he goes through that. And re remember, you know, even though people are or were um, characteristically smaller in stature than we are today, he's smaller yet. And I, you know, I can could easily get over my head um, in terms of psychology about talking about him being comp compensatory for his lack of size and all of that. But in any event, there's probably got to be some proof to the fact that you have to make some other kind of peripheral impression on people if you're not imposing, if you don't have a big voice, particularly in a military situation where you're looking for leadership. So he did it by being acute and intelligent and engaging. And when he graduates, he has a two-year obligation that is part of his education there. And you can fulfill that by going into the military or by serving the state in some role. And he elects to, just misses the Mexican War. It does, that's not part of his crucible, as it is with a lot of the other fellows that he becomes engaged with in the Civil War. But he goes to work at a private academy called the Rappahannock Academy, which is in Caroline County near Bowling Green, which is about halfway between Fredericksburg and Richmond, along Route 1, present day. He spends a couple of years there, but he's more interested in being in the mainstream of happenings. And the big happening in those days was civil engineering, because this is the day or the era when the interior of the country is really starting to get Governments are beginning to embrace their role as being funders and being involved with things like transportation networks, roads, canals, um, things of that nature. So there's, and railroads too, because this is the era of railroad building when that technology really becomes um, explosive and greatly influential. So he, he it's interesting, there, the, the, one of the challenges about writing about this fella is that he's not, well, there are a couple of challenges. First of all, he's got awful handwriting. <laughs> you know, I've been through not all of his archival material, but a lot of it. And he, you know, there may be, he may be, there may be the Rosetta Stone of <laughs> my own insights in front of me, but I can't read it. <laughs> and so I've just had to keep going and all like that. So that's, that happens. It's funny because whenever he wants to, write an official letter or uh, an official message to somebody. And this is before typewriters. Um, he gets somebody else to write it. And I know that because it's apparent because the handwriting is legible. <laughs> Nonetheless, he's also not a guy 
to, he's not a diarist. And he's not somebody to sort of, of, of unburden himself in letters to wives or, or friends or anything like that. I haven't seen much of that at all in the collection. I haven't seen all the collection yet. There's a lot left. But I already get a sense that that's not the kind of guy he is. You know, he's pretty much on point. There's plenty of correspondence, but it's all business. And so he writes a letter to, um, to Francis Smith, who's the original superintendent, very influential VMI guy, talking about his future, asking advice and sort of paternalistic thing about whether he should go into civil engineering and things like that. It's one of the few letters of that kind, and Francis Smith encourages him to do that. So Mahone's first job in civil engineering is he gets a job as a surveyor or part of a surveying crew for the Orange and Alexandria Railroad, the new project that's going between those two localities in central Virginia. Um, and he does well enough at that to be promoted. He also, since he's aspiring, decides to apply for a job as the <coughs> chief engineer of a turnpike building company that's nearby. It's building a turnpike between Gordonsville and Fredericksburg, which becomes the Orange Turnpike, and also part of it, the Orange Plank Road. You will recognize those two names, and they will come up again in this talk in the Civil War context. Uh, turnpike is an, a turnpike building is a fascinating sort of sideline to all of this. That was a big for a while, and, and and didn't work out so well because the technology is a little primitive. They would basically dig a path, and they'd line half of it with um, with built up wooden planks so that your full heavy wagons would go to the port on the plank side and when you're empty they'd go down the dirt side and you paid a toll, a turnpike. So many of today's roads, you know, the road locations really don't change that much over time. So many of the roads that are called turnpikes today, that's how they got started basically. There's literally a thing that allows you to go. And he got involved in that for a while, but you know, that relied on local wood and the wood wore out and that sort of came and went pretty quickly. So he gets back into the railroad business and this is where he really makes his mark. He takes a job as the chief engineer of a new railroad that they're building between Petersburg and Norfolk called the Norfolk and Petersburg Railroad. And, and, and this is his platform for problems. Now, one of the things to point out about uh, big civil engineering product projects in that period of time there was that there, the magnitude of them is such that it takes a lot of money and a lot of labor and a lot of raw materials as you can imagine. And in the South here, there's no funding mechanism for that, no private funding mechanism. There's not that much capital. The banks are, uh, you know, underfunded if they still exist. Uh, the only real source of revenue to get those things accomplished are taxes. And so this is when the governments become involved in the building of these projects, but not directly in the sense that their government, their government subsidized. Um, stock corporations, so there's an element of profit and risk involved. And a lot of time people lose their shirts in these things if they don't pan out. But the government can invest up to I think it's 75, 66 percent of the stock in any of these given pro projects. So that means that the common wheel is involved with the success or failure. And this is true of the uh, James River and Kanawha Canal. It's true of these railroad companies. It's true of these turnpike building companies. There's debt and risk and reward that goes along with this. And in that sense, when Mahone, as the chief engineer, becomes involved in dealing with politicians and state government. And this is also an important relationship that he established as he moves forward in life, because you have to go to these people, you have to talk to them in Richmond, you have to negotiate with them, you have to report to this outfit called the Board of Public Works, 
which is an appointed board of politician that oversees the progress and reports to the lawmakers who vote on funding. And so that's an important, as I said, an important relationship that he establishes. The other thing that he does um, in this railroad, and if you have, and you, I know you have, driven down 460 from Petersburg, between Petersburg and Suffolk, you have parallel the vector of the railroad. You can look over to the side, one side of the road to the other, and see it. And you're riding on the General Mahone Highway, so named today. And this is, he's fortunate in a sense because, the, you know, the, this is low, sandy soil without much relief. So he can, he, he can establish a straight line from Suffolk up to Petersburg. He does. But the downside of that is that he has to go through part of the Great Disney Swamp to do that, which is not an inconsiderable barrier. It's, you know, it's on a magnitude of blasting a tunnel through a, a mountain because they had to do but what he comes up with is a, is a really fascinating and innovative idea is that he does this sort of sunken, um, geez, I don't know how to describe it. I'm going to have to get more articulate before I write this. But um, he, he, he takes cypress wood, which is about the most um, indestructible wood that there is out there. He buries it, and then he covers it over with soil, so the understanding is that it's going to be able to absorb a certain amount of shrink and swell as the water table goes up and down, but not so much to disrupt the track and also have the capacity to bear weight, this tremendous weight of the, 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 the material that's going back away across it. Um, it. It works. It still works. The present day coal bearing frame tracks go over top of the same far over top, over top of the same substrate, which is really amazing, um, given all the years that have passed. So the guy, he's, he's good. And this is his, this is his concept. He, he came up with it. He rises, he rises to be president of, of the uh, railroad after a while. This is all in the mid to late 1850s. Um, while he was working for the Orange and Alexandria, he gets married. He marries a woman named Otelia Butler, whose father was a Petersburg physician, a prominent fellow. And um, he and Otelia have a long and fruitful relationship. Um, she's an interesting woman, um, but I wish a little more evident in the historical record that I've seen so far, because, you know, it, it, so far, the compelling things about this book all seem to be men behaving badly. <laughs> and, 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 you know, these days you want a little wider story than that, you know, because the assumption is that the women are just all strictly in the background and all like that. And I'd really like to uh, bring that out. I, if I may digress, I do have one opportunity. I think I've, I've stumbled on a woman who was a very acute political commentator, who wrote a regular column for a publication that was put out by Hampton University. I can't remember, I should have looked up her name. And she just shows up in shadings. Nobody's even written an article about her, but she apparently was active for a pretty long time and all over talking about politics in Virginia, even though not participating, but observing, which is good enough. So that's going to be one of my primary female voices in this. And I apologize in advance for that, because I realize that, that probably is going to make the book inadequate, but you got what you got. <laughs> in any event, Otelia and he have, or she has 13 pregnancies, but only three kids survive to adulthood, which is remarkable to contemplate, but probably even extraordinary for that era when infant. So profound. Um, and as he rises in the engineering and, and corporate world, his family prospers too. And so they end up being pretty well off. They move around a little bit um, according to where he needs to be as an executive from Norfolk to Petersburg and a few other places too. Uh, the big 
story about Otelia, and this is one of the main Mahone stories that got generated at some point in his life, was that, you know, you ride down 460 and you go past uh, Ivor, Windsor, Wakefield, Zuni, not necessarily in that order. And, and, and these places were originally stations on the Norfolk and Petersburg Railroad. And the story goes that Otelia was a really big fan of Sir Walter Scott's novels. And so she was the one that came up with these, these uh, Anglophile names. But they ran out of names and locations for one of the places, and apparently they couldn't agree on it, so they came up with the name Disputanta. Greatest <laughs> town name ever. <laughs> so that's how that got there. That's the story they tell. You know, there's a lot of stories that get told and told and told and told and retold. It's, it's like that, that quote in, um, in The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance when um, um, the old newspaper editor says, when, when um, legend rises to the level of fact, print the legend. <laughs> so, um, railroad uh, building is exploding, but the thing about it is that these are all sort of station to station or trunk lines, like, you know, they name them Norfolk and Petersburg and Orange and Alexandria and Richmond and Fredericksburg and Potomac because that's all, that's all, they don't go any farther. And what you'll have in these towns is that you'll have one line with a warehouse, and then another line with a warehouse, and which will, the, the trains don't connect. Sometimes they don't even have the same width of track. So you'll have to, if you're going to take your stuff, say, uh, from Norfolk to Lynchburg, then you have to offload in Petersburg, and then you have to put it on the South Side Railroad at their depot and truck it to Lynchburg, to their depot. And then if you want to take it to Bristol, you have to go to the truck and over to the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad's depot and then put it on that train and take it down there. It's very inefficient in that sense. But that's how it is before the Civil War, and that's why these railroads have the sort of geographic names that they have. Um, of course, the great disruptor of all of this you know, progress and movement is the war itself. Um, and Mahone has plenty of connections. He's not a provincial guy because he's talking about establishing connections with um, um, shipping routes via the sea, the eastern seaboard up to the ports, Baltimore, New York City, and everything like that. He's not isolated from a national perspective, but yet he is a staunch secessionist. His family owned slaves. He owns slaves. He doesn't seem to have any dissonance about going with the South or going with Virginia when the time comes. And, I, and once again, he's not really communicative as to what his thinking is, but his actions are pretty clear. And since he's um, a military trained guy, he's of great value to the Southern cause to the state. So he starts out as a colonel of a particular unit, and then he's promoted to a brigadier. He spends the rest of the war fighting with the Army in Northern Virginia. For much of it as a brigadier, uh, the last couple of years he gets promoted to major general. We'll talk about that. Um, not much about him. Once again, early on in the war up until around the Battle of the Crater. And the great arbiter of, of reputations among Lee's lieutenants is Douglas Southall Freeman. And Freeman says, he's sort of dismissive of Mahone, he says, well, he was a minor bit player, he was a mediocre officer until he got more responsibility late in the war, partially due to attrition, and then really took off. And that's true, but I think it, it uh, doesn't give an accurate picture of what he did early. Um, and this is something that I want to emphasize when the time comes. He's got a lot to do, for example, with the fact that the Confederates were able to seize the federal shipbuilding port in Norfolk, the Gosport Naval Yard down there before they can get their people down there and protect them. And there's a certain great benefit from getting their hands on that before the enemy does. 
one of which is that they get what the, the burnt hulk of the Merrimack, which is rebuilt into the monitor. But he does some things uh, that help the South, help Virginia hold on to that that are probably unrecognized. Also, um, it, it must have really killed him when they had to evacuate Norfolk. They're there the whole first winter, and then when the uh, Peninsula Campaign begins, the Confederates have to recede up back toward Richmond, and after the great fight between the ironclads doesn't go well from the South, and they lose their the perceived ability to control Hampton Roads. So they retreat up toward Richmond, and they have to blow up railroad bridges that he only he, you know, he built. And these are stone structures. They're not just wooden, so that's an interesting thing. But that must have killed him to see that happen. And yet, you know, once again, there's no expression of that sort of thing. But, you know, once they pull back up the line of the Norfolk and Petersburg, they don't go back. And for the rest of the war, that line is basically inoperative, reduced to nothing because they'll take rails and, and wood away from it and to elsewhere to build military railroads. So the Norfolk and Petersburg is destroyed, basically, by the war there. Even though they still have a board of directors and they still met, although I think about 1863, they, according to the record, they just went, hey, this is, you know, we're wasting our time here. There's really nothing to talk about. Um, Another thing that's important about Mahone during the Civil War um, was he had a really important role in the Battle of Drury's Bluff. The first, there's two battles, but this is the one that happened right at the end of May in 1862. And you may recall, this, uh, the, the Union Armada is coming up to James River, and the objective is Richmond. And there's nothing natural stopping them, because Richmond, obviously, is on the fall line. You know, they built Richmond at the head of navigation. So if you can get your ships up to Richmond, you can go all the way to Rocket's Landing, and boom, what are they going to do? There's no Confederate Navy to speak of. The Virginia, the Merrimack, has been scuttled, so it's not protecting the James River anymore. Who's to say you haven't won the war? You certainly have achieved one of the Anaconda objectives, which was you know blockade this coast, get the Mississippi River, and take Richmond. But there's this one place, a bend in the river there, Drury's Bluff, High Bluff, where you have this straight <coughs> shot toward of, or down the river there that you can build fort and position guns, and that's exactly what they do, and Mahone's the chief engineer of that sort of thing. So they bring up some ships, they bring up some ironclad, they bring up some troops, and they get overwhelmed by the fire from that fort, turn around, go back, and they never try it again, which is curious to me, I think. Um, out west, if they took that sort of attitude, they'd have never made it past Vicksburg or New Orleans or any of those places. But they're not up to that here in Virginia. And so Mahone's involvement in frustrating that and leaving such an indelible impression enables to me, in my mind, the, the, the cause the war to continue, for, you know, for good or ill. Um, pretty soon after that, the Seven Days Battles, his guys are heavily involved in that take some serious casualties at the Battle of Marlton Hill. Uh, when the action shifts up toward Manassas, he's sent up there also, and he sustains um, the only wound that he takes in the war. Uh, it's in the second day of the Battle of Second Manassas up there. He's leading troops on an attack, and it sounds like, although it's never really been specified, that he gets hit in the rib cage by a spent bullet. It doesn't penetrate. Um, you know, into his body cavity, but it sounds like it breaks a couple of ribs because he's incapacitated for months after that. You know, the famous story that goes with that is that, and I, this I got on the record, um, word comes to Otelia, who's working as a volunteer nurse at one of the hospitals down in Richmond, and they come to her and they say, uh, Mrs. Mahone, we've got some bad news. This is going to sound like a bad joke. Mrs. Mahone, we got some bad news for you. Um, William has been injured, but it's only a flesh wound. And she says, then the, I know it's serious because William hasn't got any flesh. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's put out of action, misses the Battle of Antietam. His troops are, don't do well in the Antietam campaign without their leader. But they come back together again. He's back in time for Fredericksburg. Really not very involved in that battle on the periphery of the Confederate defenses. 
um, is involved in the Chancellorsville campaign. On the first day of Chancellorsville, when General Meade has pushed his armies out from Chancellorsville toward the east to confront uh, Lee's army, um, Mahone's guys are in the lead that give uh, Meade's guys, or Hooker's guys rather, a bloody nose, Meade and Hooker, a bloody nose and convince him to go back, reverse back to the intersection of Chancellorsville where he turns the control of the battle over the Confederates or leaves a void in that. And that's when Lee and Jackson sit down and come up with that ornate flank attack that was so profound. Um, after that at Gettysburg, um, he has an interesting role at Gettysburg, sort of as a void. Um, and it, it, if he'd had a bigger role in the Battle of Gettysburg, I think anybody who's prominent at Gettysburg becomes famous just because by virtue of what you did at, on three days, or one of the three days, no matter what you did before that or after, you know, you get attended to and talked about because of that. And his brigade up there has the least amount of casualties of any Confederate brigade in the battle. The question is why? Well, he's up there on Cemetery Ridge, or Seminary Ridge, He's in the middle of things, but it gets, he gets caught up in the backwash of this whole confusing, disconnected command structure that becomes so controversial about that battle. You know, did Wall Street do the right thing? Did Lee overreach? You know, why was everybody just sort of loathing? Uh, you know, um, and, and not efficient when they needed to be at their peak. That's one way to characterize the historiography of that battle. And, and um, Mahone is supposed to be part of the big charge on day three. Um, but there's a story that he goes to his peers and, and tries to get them to go with him to his superior officer and say, look, this business of charge across that big field, you know, this is crazy. This is not going to work. But that's uninfluential. And, and, and what's also curious is that even though his guys haven't been shot up, they're not put into that attack, whereas some other units that have been virtually decimated in the days leading up to that battle really get put in important positions in that attack and don't perform well. So that's sort of mysterious. You know, there's not a real big sort of Gettysburg component to my own story. It's more of a question mark. Um, the next thing that he's involved with significantly the Battle of the Wilderness the following spring is that his guys are the ones that accidentally shoot General Longstreet. Longstreet it is it, it, this you know this this eerie coincidence about location and and and, and scenario of uh, the similar to Stonewall Jackson's theory. I mean, although Longstreet's not fatally wounded he's still knocked out for months and it's Mahone guys who get confused in the smoke and, and just a general tumult of battle and actually fire the shots that get launched. But the ill wind that blows nobody some good. His uh, commanding officer, Richard Anderson, gets moved up to Corps Command and Mahone gets moved up to Division Command. So this is the beginning of his ascension into a more vital player as far as the Confederate Army is concerned. And he plays that role well throughout the rest of the war. He's the one guy that Lee really comes to feel like he can count on to do something aggressive. Um, the Battle of the Crater, the big day, of course, uh, June 30th, 1864, you all know about the setup of that battle. Um, it's his guys that counterattack at the end of, toward the end of the day when the Union forces have stalled and drive them back out of the crater. And his, so Mahone is is known from there forward as Hero of the Crater. It also gets him promoted to Major General, too, for the rest of the war, which he deserved from being a division commander. That's what you're supposed to be. You know, there's a lot written about the Crater. A lot written about the Crater. I, I can't think of anything next to Gettysburg that has as many books about it as the Crater. And it's captured people's imagination for any number of reasons. But one of the really ugly things that happens is it's also one of the documented locations where black troops not only involved in the battle, but are executed by their Confederate captains after. There's no quarter taken. And they admit it. 
there's not any sort of, of they, they're, they're proud of it in their letters home. They say they did it. Um, there, there's no equivocation about that. And that becomes an interesting irony later in Mahone's life. The rest of the war, you know, in 1864, also tends to be somewhat of a political void because you don't hear a lot about all the activity that happened around Richmond then until Appomattox. And in the Appomattox campaign, Mahone's guys, since they're well equipped and well led, are the rear guard of the army and are holding back the, the Union troops as, 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 and do a pretty good job of that. Um, the controversial thing that happens two days before the war is that they come up to the Appomattox River and are, have to cross uh, a low bridge and the so-called high bridge, which is an extraordinary railroad bridge on the South Side Railroad built over the Appomattox River gorge there. Um, it's now a state park and a wonderful location to visit. But um, so Mahone's job is the rear guard to burn the building, burn the bridge. And, and that doesn't get done efficiently, and there's all sorts of recrimination about that. But once again, I think Mahone was probably looking at that bridge, knowing that the gig was just about up and thinking, jeez, oh, you know, <laughs> this is senseless. <laughs> so who knows? At Appomattox, his guys, his division is, he has the most guys surrender in any division in the Confederate Army. They're the most intact, which speaks to his executive. Now, we go into, back into the railroad life of Mahone, because Mahone, being a, a progressive thinker, realizes, and a railroad man, realizes that the state's got to put itself back together somehow, which is not going to be easy since much of the state has been trampled in the dust. The railroads have been destroyed, the canals have been destroyed, the farms have been destroyed. Um, wealth has been destroyed, prosperity has been destroyed. Slaves are now free, and as you know, they were assessed as personal property and taxed as personal property. So that's less money for the state law, too. Then you have this whole social issue about what to do about this new society here where slavery was such a presence and is no longer. Mahone, the first thing he does is he consolidates the three independent lines that uh, stretch from Bristol to Petersburg. Petersburg, Norfolk and Petersburg, the south side, which goes from Petersburg to Lynchburg, and the Virginia and Tennessee that goes to Bristol. And he renames these railroads the Atlantic, Mississippi, and Ohio. The A, M, and O, which some people said, another joke, stands for all mine and Otelians. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, and it's interesting because you can tell what he has in mind. The big picture here is he wants to connect coastal commerce with Norfolk as the port, with the great waterways of the mid-section of the country, the Mississippi and the Ohio. And that was his dream, to, to consolidate that road and then build it through Kentucky and other states so that we were able to send all of that stuff down through central Virginia. Um, this, his timing is not so good in the 1870s because this is just a little too early for the opening of the West Virginia coal fields, which makes that railroad prosperous. The fact that you've got your energy source relatively close to your port is an important thing. And that's what made the NW prosperous. That's what made Roanoke prosperous. It continues to. But nobody <coughs> conceived of that. If they had, then his railroad would have had a completely different concept. Um, and, and the other problem that really ultimately destroys his idea, too, is just it, the, the financing and the capital is not there. It's so tenuous, and it can't be done by private investors. The private investors in America are more interested in, in, in investing in northern railroads. They're the real powerhouses. So he has to go to England to find people that will buy a bond for his railroad. And that's, you know, the, the distance, the communication issues, compounded by the uneven economy of, of the nation in those days, um, make prosperity of the AM and O so fragile that it collapses. It goes into receivership. And he loses control. And he's got enough political 
opponents at this point in time where he's not about to get it back. Now, a lot of those political opponents are funded by other railroad interests, which are very competitive at this point in time. The Pennsylvania Railroad, the Baltimore and Ohio are, you know, basically a uh, civil war is good for both of them, more so the Pennsylvania than the Baltimore and Ohio, because the Baltimore and Ohio was destroyed from time to time. But nonetheless, they did well. They got lots of money. They're interested in, in carpet bagging, going down south and getting the resources and prosperity. So they're very interested in these north-south lines through the state of Virginia. While Mahone's thinking east-west, they're thinking north-south. So the Orange and Alexandria people, the, Fri the Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac people become arch enemies or competitors for Mahone for what little funding there is to, and for, to, to support his railroad. And ultimately, they win. Uh, Mahone, uh, the A M and O goes bankrupt. Uh, he is removed. The railroad is in receivership until it's purchased by financiers from the Philadelphia Company, who rename it the Norfolk and Western, and decide to put the general shops and headquarters in this little hamlet with the hick name of Big Lick. <laughs>